Hello, everyone. Um, as Alex said, I'm, uh, I'm Des, so I'm one of the directors at the Norman Lockyer Observatory. Um, it's quite funny, last October time, um, Alex came to us for um, one of our um, science events, as did SpaceX, so I'm sort of returning the favour. He's getting to, uh, to introduce me and I'm coming to do a talk here. I feel like I'm turning around at one point here because we've heard some great talks about looking to the future, looking for things going ahead. I'm just going to look back where we've come from, the sort of things of where the observatory came out of, the, where the history of the observatory is. And I'm taking the theme of British Science Week, which is all about uh, connections. And when you start to see the connections between all kinds of different people, it's almost a case of spot how many names you recognise. I'm not here to name drop. I didn't know these people. <laughs> Certainly not 1800s or anything like that. But it's a case of let's have a look at um, where these things come from. So it will say that it's not a question of, um, of what you know, it's who you know. And I think in some cases this is um, what happened here with, with Norman Lockyer and, and moving forward. Um, so it's a case of, you know, let's see where Norman came from, um, the things he did, and then well, the things he achieved and where we are um, today from there. So, Norman Lockyer, born, well, in the last year of the reign of um, William IV. So, Queen Victoria came to the throne the following year after, uh, after he was born. Um, I guess you could say that he wasn't really a scientist to start with. Um, in, well, interested in the arts, fluent in three languages. Um, I hate the phrase there at the bottom. He became employed at the War Office as a second-rate clerk. Um, it makes it sound like he was no good. Um, but he certainly was pretty good um, at the things um, he did. Um, he'd been a student teacher and, um, and that sort of thing. He had to go into work by train. Um, obviously, he's sort of a sociable man. Um, starts making friends and um, talking to people. Um, and one of them was a barrister, a um, guy called uh, George Pollock, who lent him what is by today's standards a fairly small um, telescope. And Norman Lockyer starts studying the moon, starts looking um, at that, starting to observe things with his telescope, and joined the British Association, which meant he started to see and meet um, some of the, sort of the leading people of the day. Um, one of those was Sir John Herschel. Now, that's the son of um, William Herschel, who uh, discovered Uranus. And obviously, he would then be the, um, the nephew, uh, I guess, of Caroline Herschel. Um, so famous astronomers. He starts, obviously, being involved and um, getting to know um, these people. And when you're involved in a group of people and you start to see um, and meet these, these sort of people, obviously he's going to rub off and it's, um, he's going to get interested in the, the various things. He then looked for a research project. Now, he's working at the war office, he's doing his, his day job and all that sort of thing, but he wanted to start studying something, so he started studying the sun. Now, the first thing which everyone's going to tell you is, for goodness sake, don't point a telescope at the sun. But you can do it safely, you project it, and, and that sort of thing. But he starts you know, making drawings. And the thing that gets me is that's a drawing that's incredibly detailed. If you got me to draw a sunspot, it would be a big black blob, and that would be as far as I would go. But incredibly detailed drawings um, and starts um, you know, looking in, um, and observing. So, you know, starting um, to look at the sun, he's obviously been looking at the moon in, in a part of a project that's been mapping the moon, um, looking, looking at the sun. And he was also, you know, all these, how many other things is he getting involved in? Getting involved in um, events was it, um, on Thursdays. So, I love the, the sort of title, Talk Tobacco in a Tipple on the Thursdays. Um, so, looking at... Uh, and meeting and chatting to, to people of the day. And, yeah, Charles Darwin, um, the publisher uh, Macmillan, Huxley, Norman himself involved in there. I'm going to say he probably wasn't that old at that point, but there's lots of people of influence in, in Victorian times. Now, I have to say, of course, it's not 
as enlightened as it is today, you know, generally men of a certain standing and that sort of thing. But he was involved in sort of talking to, um, to all these, um, these well-known people or people we still know um, today. Because of the fact, I guess, of his artistic background, try to form um, a scientific publication. Science was becoming something that was not just a rich man's hobby. It was becoming more serious. We're talking sort of middle of the 1800s. People wanted to publish things. People wanted to actually you know, learn about what was going on with science. And it wasn't just something you experimented with and, and tried. And so he um, was editing a publication called The Reader. Um, 1863, it's got there. It wasn't a success, um, but it was a start. Um, and he was, uh, Lockyer was then being involved with, um, with people of the day because of that. Aside from all the other things that Lockyer liked, sort of looking at the sun, he started to get an interest in spectroscopy. And spectroscopy, I'm sure you know that all elements, when you heat them, you burn them, they emit um, different colours and so on. We still use them. You know, sodium lights glow yellow, um, put strontium, um, at, uh, strontium molecules in fireworks to get a red colour, that sort of thing. And people realise that. And again, people that you'll have heard of, people like Kirchhoff and, uh, and Bunsen, um, you know, Bunsen burner, Kirchhoff, me as an electronics engineer, I spent ages studying his laws to get my degree. Um, but people like that realised that you could start looking at the emission of stars, you could look at the emission of different, different things and work out what's in them. Because if you can see the colours glowing effectively, that's when you can work out what's involved in there. And that's all very well. You could take a sample, you hold it in your new Bunsen burner and you see it glowing and you can get a spectrum. But can you apply that to something a bit more distant? Can you apply that to something 93 million miles away, like the sun? And so they started, um, and uh, Lockyer started as well, looking at spectroscopy and starting to look at what, was, uh, what the elements were in the sun. He bought a solar uh, spectroscope. Now, the cost of that was about a pound in uh, Victorian times, that's probably about £100 or so these days. I don't know whether I would want to even look through something at the sun that cost me £100, not today. It's just one of those things. It takes a certain amount of bravery, I think, to sort of look through something at the sun with all the warnings that we say. But you know, that starts allowing him to see what's, uh, what's involved in the sun when he starts looking at it. And you've got to remember that this is, a, this is somebody who was interested in the arts. He worked in the war office, you know, and he's now getting more and more of an interest in you know, the, um, the sky and, and seeing uh, what's involved. And he started to get a spectrum. I don't know whether you can sort of see this, but you know, looking at the, the prominences and, um, and looking at um, the various parts of the sun, he's getting bright lines. So emission spectra, uh, this is um, the hydrogen emission. You know, they realise there's hydrogen in the sun because it matches what we see as hydrogen um, uh, down here on Earth. And there were occasionally times when they would spot elements they didn't recognise or lines they didn't recognise, lines they weren't expecting. We now know what this one is, but he was finding ones he, um, he didn't know. For scale, of course, this is a prominence, also a flare coming off, and there's Earth. You know, talking about there being no planet B, there's hardly a planet A in scale like that. That's a tiny, tiny little bit compared to the sun. It's a good job we're a long way away. In 1868, there, there turned out to be two sets of crucial observations. Now, during a, um, a solar eclipse in India, uh, Pierre Janssen, a uh, Frenchman, observed the sun, got a spectrum, and he was finding these lines that he didn't know, didn't understand. They didn't make sense. They didn't line up. If we know what this is hydrogen and we assume there's hydrogen in the sun, well, what's that? You know, we don't know. And people assumed it was one of the, the lines of sodium, so they assumed there's sodium in the sun. But Janssen made the assumption and made the guess that maybe there's a new element there. And in October 1868, so a couple of months later, Lockyer observed the same. And they both wrote letters 
to the Paris, uh, to the French Academy of Sciences in Paris, and they put their findings. Two months apart, they write their letters, post being what it is. They arrived on the same day. Quite incredible. They both send the letters and whatever. They arrived on the same day, and they both had come to the same conclusion, but independently, um, to say, we think there's a new element. Now, the new element, you know, they had no idea what it was. Because one of those strange things, it's an element you've discovered, but there's nothing here on Earth. You can't actually see it. You can't exactly play with it and, and have a look at it. And because it came from the sun, they used the name of the sun god, Helios. They called it helium. It's a tiny mistake, ultimately, calling it helium, because that assumes it's a metal. We now know it's a gas. And it was in, well, nearly 30 years later, I think it's 27 years later, William Ramsey in Scotland found helium here on Earth and proved that it was the same thing, proved it was the same gas. And apparently there's a story that William Ramsey offered um, Norman Lockyer the chance to rename his element, because in theory it should be helium to fit with argon, neon, and all the other noble gases. But it never got changed. So there's always the anomaly. When you look down the periodic table in the noble gases group, helium, because of the fact it was discovered in space before it was discovered here on Earth, um, that's why it has a non-consistent name um, in its group. But it's, you know, there's an, an interesting thing here. They are probably the only people who will ever discover an element that they don't have physically. You know, remote discovery of an element from 93 million miles away. It's quite impressive. Not dissuaded by the failure of the reader, Lockyer has another go at editing a journal. And 4th of November, 1869, founds Nature. Now, I'm sure everyone's heard of Nature. I saw in the talks there were references uh, quoting Nature. So that was a lot more of a success. It wasn't initially. Uh, Macmillan actually had to bankroll it for a while, for its first few years. But Norman Lockyer remained the editor for about 50 years of the, the uh, journal Nature. So it always brings a little smile to my face when I, when I hear, you know, listen to an article or something written, uh, done on the radio or whatever, and they say, oh, this was published in Nature. And I think, tiny link back, uh, back to Norman Lockyer. And, yeah, that's, that's where it started. And um, he, was, um, he was the editor for a while. 1911, so time's moved on. We're now into the 20th century. Um, I guess we're now into the times of George V, if we're keeping track of the, um, the kings and queens. Um, and London was getting a bit too smoky. Um, so the Solar Physics Observatory had been in Kensington, um, it's been in uh, central London. It's all getting too smoky. I would imagine there's a bit of light pollution, but obviously it doesn't apply with the, with the sun. Um, so they decided to move the observatory. Lockyer wanted to move it to Surrey. Not sure why he wanted to move Surrey in particular, um, but the decision, he was overruled, they moved it all to Cambridge, which I believe is where it still is now. Um, Lockyer didn't like the, um, the idea. I think that's an understatement. So he picked up some of the equipment and moved to Sidmouth, which is why we have this local tie down here. And he decided to, uh, to found what he then called the Hill Observatory on top of a hill just outside of Sidmouth, a little village, um, Solcombe Regis, basically. Um, yeah, nice location. Absolutely dreadful when the mist comes in, but uh, we have to deal with that. And that's where he um, created um, an observatory. So, been founded. Um, it cost a reasonable amount of money. Now, OK, £9,000, one donation, Francis McLean. Uh, £5,000 from Sir Norman and Lady Lockyer. If you put that in today's figures, that's, well, well over a million pounds in total um, to found this observatory. Yeah. Clean sites, they've, um, they've built the domes, they've built some buildings and, um, and so on. And yeah, there was one um, telescope um, donated along with the money by uh, Francis McLean. Um, and you know, some money and, shall we just say, some equipment that came from Kensington um, that ended up in the observatory too. And we could show you photos of that because we still have it. 
Um, so there was equipment, you know, the Kensington telescope that came along, um, still operational. Um, we uh, have it in a dome. Um, and also the McLean telescope, which is not surprising in, the, in what we call the McLean dome. So these um, pieces of equipment came along, um, put in, I wouldn't say purpose built, but freshly built uh, domes. They were um, then there uh, and ready to be used. If you want more connections, you know, I've mentioned Bunsen, I've mentioned people um, you'll have heard of. The sun, um, the, the McLean sun, um, was a keen aviator, you know, interested in this new thing of flight. Now, the first flight at Kitty Hawk, 1903, December 1903. This is a photo 1909. So here we have McLean in the middle. We've got Lockyer's son on the photo. And then look for the names you recognise. The Schwartz brothers, Belfast, yeah. aviators. Um, we've got Rolls, but no Royce on the photograph. And two names definitely you'd know, Wilbur Wright and Orville Wright. One of the first Wright flyers came um, and was bought, um, brought over here. Um, you know, part of, part of the flying um, that was then done. So if you want links, we're not just talking about Norman Lockyer who's discovered an element and is talking to people of the day like Charles Darwin, linked to um, John Herschel, but also we now get into flying and, and that sort of thing. And there was actually an airstrip, um, you know, a runway um, on our site. This is the observatory, I would say today, probably last year, uh, they flew over. That's the same site, you can see the road going past. And there was an airstrip and the domes were there. The domes are still there. And we still have them, still use them. We've obviously expanded the site. I say we, the observatory society has expanded the site over years. But it's obviously moved forward um, over time. The trees have grown. In fact, when I look at this, it looks like the trees have walked from down the hill up to the top of the hill because um, <laughs> there were trees in Sidmouth at the time and now there are trees on top of the hill. I certainly wouldn't want to fly a plane in or out of our um, observatory site, not today. We also, uh, well, we, there were plans at time to, for building other um, domes. And so, you know, we've got McLean's dome, we've got the Kensington dome um, that have been built. There was a, um, a project to start another dome, um, a sponsor that we got here, Prince and Princess um, Arthur of Connaught. They cut uh, the first sod, starting to, to dig out the foundations. But look at the date, April 1914. It's only a couple of months before Archduke uh, Ferdinand is shot. You know, a few months later, the world's at war, uh, project's put on hold. But the start was made. Sir Norman himself died in 1920. Um, he was 84, been, you know, say, editing uh, Nature for quite some time. Um, James, his son, took over the observatory and renamed it as the Norman Lockyer Observatory. Yeah. As you will, named it after his dad. Um, James was there for another 16 years, um, and he died suddenly in 1936. So just before the Second World War now. And the day-to-day -day running of the observatory taken over by what became the University of Exeter, so the University College of, of South West England. So you can see there's lots of links now coming on between us and the university and the, um, and the people um, of the day. And it was run with an, um, a, an astronomer um, until 1961, um, when sadly, well, the last permanent astronomer um, retired, Donald Barber, um, and it sort of fell into disrepair and they thought about redeveloping the site. But it was reborn. Um, about well, nearly 30 years later, um, the Norman Lockyer Observatory was um, formed, reopened um, by Patrick Moore, 1989, and I would say we're thriving um, today. So it's one of those things, when you um, turn up, the first time I went up to the observatory, I mean, I went to, wanted to go to a place to just look at the stars and see the stars. I go up there, there's blue plaques on the wall. We've got a blue plaque for um, the inventor of the diode on the, on the wall. There's plaques around with names you've heard of, like Patrick Moore. 
and you think, this is a bit more impressive. I mean, there's, there's lots of history, and the more, the longer I've been um, involved with the observatory, the more I find out, the more it's interesting it is. All these names you've heard of, they've all come down and they've all been there. We also, we, the observatory, finished the Connaught Dome. I mean, it took nearly 100 years, but it was finished, and our current patron came and opened it for us. So, astrophysicist, I'm sure you recognise Dr Brian May, um, also plays the guitar occasionally, apparently. Um, but uh, yeah, he's our patron. He came and, um, and opened the dome, so we finished off what was, um, what was meant to be used. Um, this um, now houses a 20-inch uh, telescope. It's the home to our technology centre. We do meteor detection, lightning detection, um, and a few other things from inside the dome. And we run lots of events um, up there. We have open evenings. Um, we have regular members' um, evenings. Um, I say we're quite a, quite a thriving um, community and quite a friendly community. Remember, we're all amateurs. Um, this is our hobby. We like people to come along and we like to talk to people. We like, like to have people along um, to see. So, yeah, it is now quite a, um, a good site. It's probably not as dark as we'd like it to be. <laughs> Certainly, as I often joke, we know where next to Chiefs are playing at home because we can see their lights at Sandy Park in the distance. We have domes, we have a planetarium. And again, you'll start to spot the names because the planetarium is named after um, James Lockyer. The lecture theatre, named for Donald Barber, the, the last um, astronomer we had on site. Um, there's various telescopes, and yeah, the domes are still there um, that, that Lockyer, Norman Lockyer himself, started. Um, and we are a friendly, um, a friendly sort of society that we can do. So if you're interested, please come along and talk to us. Come and see us. In keeping with everyone this today, so it seems, I have a QR code too. Point your camera at that, and it will take you to our website. You can see the agenda that we've got. And... This time next week, we'll have our British Science Week um, event. Um, we've called it We're All Made of Star Stuff, because obviously that's where we all come from. Everything come, is made in the stars, and um, that's um, where, we're, where all of our atoms uh, come from. The final bit at the bottom is just something that was noticed last night by a lot of the members. If you use what three words you want to come and find this, you will never forget, because this is absolutely perfect for an astronomy location, zone total rainy. <laughs> That's where we're located. So, a quick overview of the history, probably condensing 150 years or more um, into a few minutes. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.